falls in the spirit. Hunger falls in the spirit. Okay. All right. Okay, guys, welcome. <clears throat> Just waiting for my picture to show up. Pray for the internet connection. Stay strong. I'm in my brother's place. And as you see, I'm on a little earlier than normal because this is when the house is empty. And pray because uh, when I put on my computer charger downstairs in the socket, the computer shut down twice, so I'm hoping it's just the socket downstairs because I used the computer charger earlier at Barnes and Nobles and worked perfectly. So pray against that by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So good to see you guys. I want to continue where I left off yesterday. Two questions came up that I want to address. Uh, we'll wait a few more minutes. We'll pray, ask the Holy Spirit to fill this session for the glory of Jesus Christ and to sanctify us and set me apart to glorify Jesus and bless you for the glory of Jesus Christ. Two questions were asked. What about the book of life and Saul? Wasn't Saul regenerated? In 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6 and verses 9 to 11. So if he was regenerated, made a new creation, and the Holy Spirit was taken away, does that mean you can lose salvation? Pray for the internet connection. Pray in Jesus' name, but by the grace of the Lord Jesus, power of the Holy Spirit, stay strong. And we don't buffer. I hate when it buffers, man. All right? So, pray the Holy Spirit beatifies me with the beauty of Jesus. Right? Let me answer that question. Tafsir Ibn Jesus, he's got a big life decision about school. Yeah. Well, I'm over here by the router, Protestant. I'm right next to the router, right here. It's right next to me, buddy. So I don't know what else to do. You know, if you want me to get upset at the router and route it. And a Tafsir Ibn Jesus was asking about school, right? Daif. It's Daif, brother. Daif, brother. Yeah, it's freezing up. Ya Alem Sheikh Abkhel Khiamar, your father, so my spirit, please, my God. Daif, brother. Daif. Daif, brother. Anyway, I guess Tafsir bin Jesus doesn't want me to answer the question, so that's fine. Father, we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love you. We love you because you are God. And that alone makes you infinitely worthy to be loved, to be praised, to be worshipped, to be glorified. Thank you for the gift of salvation, the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ coming to the perfectly revealing God in human flesh and living the life we couldn't live and dying the accursed death that we deserve. And thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, Father. We need the Lord Jesus. We need your Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah, Maria, please, my God. You need me? <clears throat> I need you, Lord. So bless this session. Bless the strength even of the internet because even that is because of your grace. Bless the quality of the picture, Father, the sound, so they can hear my voice by the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father. Please, by the power of the Holy Spirit, fill me with knowledge, wisdom, understanding, to correctly interpret Scripture, to recall Scripture correctly, handle it correctly, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll be convicted to know you more perfectly, to love you more passionately, and to live for you more faithfully. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Cleanse in the holy blood of Jesus, Father. The holy blood of Jesus, the blood of Christ. Please, my God. Yahweh. And purify our loved ones, Lord. Purify my daughters, my angels in the blood of Jesus. Wash them in the blood of Jesus. Seal them by the Spirit. And provide through me for them. Provide for us, Father. For the sake of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Fill us with your Spirit, Father. Fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life. And save me from stammering and confusion. And bless everyone here with understanding from your spirit. And save us from attacks of Satan and the children of the evil one. Surround us with a wall of fire from the Holy Spirit for your glory, Father. We love you, Father. Have your way. We love you, Lord Jesus. Be magnified in this session. We love you, Holy Spirit. Sanctify us for the glory of Christ. And please guide this discussion. 
and bless the connection for the glory of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Yeah, hold on, sister. I guess you're saying by the router it's better. I'm right here. Should I move or should I just stay here? Because the picture is a little blurry. What's up, Al? Good to see you, brother. I'm going to continue where I left off. Pray for the internet connection. Pray that my computer charger is not messed up because I'm going to have to go to the Mac store. Thank God it's on, on warranty. Right? Okay, good. I want to continue where I left off, providing further evidence that the Old Testament saints were saved the same way we are saved. So if you have, hear any teaching, if you hear any teaching where it says the Old Testament saints were justified differently from the way we are justified because there are different dispensations of salvation, right? That is unbiblical. Those people who teach that haven't studied the scriptures clearly enough and haven't understood the scriptures clearly enough. And hopefully by the grace of God's spirit, the spirit will awaken them and convict them to see the error of their ways. Because growing up, I used to be taught the following, that the Holy Spirit would temporarily come upon people in the Old Testament, but wouldn't permanently indwell people. And that during the Old Testament dispensation, particularly the Mosaic Covenant, when the law of Moses was given, they're expected to keep the law to be saved, right? How many of you have been taught that growing up? I used to, I was taught that as well. Even my chair is uncomfortable. Lord Jesus, bless this session in Jesus' name, right? Okay. That's actually unbiblical. The consistent testimony of the Old and New Testaments is that all true believers, all the people of God, all saints were saved by the grace of the triune God through their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ the coming Messiah, because the Spirit of God revealed to them the coming of Messiah, right? But anyway, let me answer two questions. Let me answer two questions that came up. What about Saul, right? Saul. We saw yesterday that God rejected Saul, 2 Samuel 7, 14 and 15. And if you want an even clearer, more explicit chapter showing that Saul was rejected, 1 Samuel chapter 28, the entire chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 28, the entire chapter, right? There, you'll be told clearly, God rejected Saul along with 1 Samuel 15. So write down these chapters. We're not going to look at them. 1 Samuel chapter 15, 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1 Samuel chapter 28, and 2 Samuel 7, verses 4, 14 to 15, specifically verse 15. He was rejected by God. The Holy Spirit was taken away from him, and an evil spirit was given in the place of the Holy Spirit to torment him, to, <clears throat> to make his life miserable because God had rejected him. God was fed up with him. God handed him over to the desires of his heart and gave him what he deserved. Everyone with me there? Everyone with me so far? I'm trusting you're listening. The internet connection is going to stay strong. The quality of the picture stay strong, and the Holy Spirit will anoint me to speak truth for the glory of Christ without error, right? Hopefully you get about 200. I know it's a little earlier. Okay, so, but here's the thing. Side note. Notice in 1 Samuel 16, when you get a chance to read it, you'll note that an evil spirit only came upon Saul to torment Paul when the Holy Spirit left. This is one of the passages that strongly argue that if you're born of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit indwells you, you cannot be demon-possessed. The Holy Spirit must depart from you, leave you for an unclean spirit to control and possess you. Right? Because there are Christians who believe that you can be born of the Spirit and still be demon-possessed. There is no evidence of that in Scripture. You can be attacked by demons and the devil you can be oppressed by demons you can be oppressed by the devil but they cannot control your will and your mind your volition to make you do something contrary to your will if you're born of the spirit and walking in union with the holy spirit i'm talking about believers here okay and saul is an illustration of someone 
whom God rejected and took away the Holy Spirit from, and that's when an evil spirit took over. The Holy Spirit left, and an evil spirit sent God with God's permission to torment him took over. With God's permission to torment him took over. Protestant believer in post said it. Thank you, brother. Please, my God. He just posted it. 1 Samuel 16, verse 14, right? But the spirit of Jehovah departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from Jehovah troubled him. Okay. And what about it, Gerson? Gerson, are you asking your child to challenge me because you're going to disappoint me by quoting Matthew 16, 23, assuming that Jesus was saying that Peter was possessed of the devil. And if even if he was, how does that prove your point, Gerson? Let me see if you thought through that passage. Gerson, let's see. Do you understand that passage, Matthew 16, 23, which you're misapplying? Brother, Matthew 16, 23, even if it's talking about Peter being controlled by the devil, the Holy Spirit had not been given to any one of them. Gerson, pay attention. This is why, again, and you're asking because you want to learn. So God bless you, brother. I pray the Holy Spirit will use me as a teacher to bless you to understand the Word of God. During that time of salvation history, when Jesus is on earth, the Holy Spirit remained upon Christ in all his fullness and was not given to anyone else. From the time of Jesus' baptism, guys, perk up your ears and listen. Listen. This is where I need you to listen so you learn how to interpret Scripture. From the time the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus at his baptism, Mark chapter 1, verse 10, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Write these down. Mark 1, 10, Matthew 3, 16. As the Holy Spirit enables me to recall the passages correctly for the glory of Christ. Luke 3, 22, and John 1, 32 to 33. Right? When the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus at his baptism, from that moment until Jesus' resurrection and then ascension into heaven, the Holy Spirit was not given to anyone else. So here, Gerson, you're quoting a passage during the time in which the Holy Spirit is now in Christ, upon Christ, filling Christ with all his fullness, and so wasn't indwelling anyone else. So how does that address the issue? Even if Jesus was calling Peter, Satan, in the sense that he was controlled by Satan, Peter did not have the Holy Spirit filling him, and he was not born again as yet. And then cross-reference, John 7, 38 to 39, John 7, 38 to 39, and John 14, verses 16 to 17, and John 16, verse 7. John 7, 38 to 39, John 14, verses 16 to 17, and John 16, verse 7, all of which say the Holy Spirit was not indwelling the apostles. They were not spiritually made alive by the Spirit because the Spirit was on Christ and wouldn't be given to them until Christ was glorified. Right? Don't just tell me, okay, did you get it? Okay, Miss Piggy, what does that got to do with my point, though? No, not even Pentecost, even before that, Gerson. If you go to John chapter 20, this is why I don't want you to confuse yourselves. Verse 22, before Pentecost, Jesus breathed on the disciples, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. So he breathed on them, spiritual life, breathed the Holy Spirit upon them. Pentecost, something else is taking place. This is why you guys are going to confuse the heck out of yourselves, because you're all over the map, everywhere in the Bible, and you don't know how to tie in the passages together. So you create contradictions and confuse yourselves. Like Miss Piggy just mentioned that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. Right? That's Luke chapter 1, verse 15. Luke chapter 1, verse 15. What has that got to do with the Holy Spirit not being given to anyone else from the time of Jesus' baptism? And Miss Biggie, what has that got to do with my point? Because you heard me say that, and then you quoted a passage where John the Baptist, at conception, was filled with the Holy Spirit, 
What has that got to do with Jesus' baptism where the Spirit came upon him and would not be given to anyone else until he, he left? I want to see what's the connection. Yeah. What's the connection? Okay. You guys need to really focus and pray the Holy Spirit will guide us all, guide me as well, save us from error, give us the power to live the truth of God for the glory of Christ and to understand scriptures correctly because you guys are all over the map. And you know who's responsible for that? You know who's responsible? If you guys are attending church, you know who's responsible? The shepherds, the pastors, because they're doing a job of educating people about what the Bible teaches about these core issues. You with me there? Terrible job. These pastors are going to answer to the Lord, especially when that's their full-time job and they get paid. Some of them get paid real hefty salaries, whereas the rest of us in full-time ministry are struggling, and we got corrupt, wicked, filthy judges of the devil, filled with the devil after us for money we don't have. Terrible. Terrible. Well, he didn't say it in those words, Andrew. He said he must go for the Spirit to come. He didn't say he had to die for the Spirit to come. He said he must go, Andrew, and then he'll send the Holy Spirit. Okay. Anyway, so far with me because we're going a far drift. Yes, John 16, 7. He must depart and then he'll send the Spirit. Yes, I know in the context he's going to be taken to be killed on the cross, but then he'll be raised immortal and then he'll send the Spirit. Yeah, we're not talking to Andrew Martin, talking about the other one, Andrew Owen. There are two Andrews here. One is fake, the other is genuine. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, okay, now let's come back to the two points so we don't confuse everyone. Let's come back and here again, let's observe some rules so we don't get out of hand and gets chaotic. Help me to help you by focusing, asking questions that are relevant, and making sure you're getting the point. Don't ask questions that you think are relevant, but will take me off topic. And Andrew Owen, we don't say L-M-A-O. We say L-M-B-O because we don't want to say laugh my aspirations off. Someone's going to see that and say, oh, what a Christian, right? Anyway. Is it with me? Hopefully the connection is going to say something. I don't know. I'm getting frustrated with the connection here. I don't know. Is connection okay? Is it buffering? Because of my end, it looks like it's buffering. Should I go downstairs? I don't know. Should I stay up here? Because you told me closer to the router, it's better. All right. Okay. All right. Question. Was Saul regenerated? Was Saul born again? Was Saul transformed, made a new creation? And if so... Then how is it the Holy Spirit was taken away from him and he died and withered? That was the question. I remember that was the question that came up yesterday. You listening? Was Saul born again, regenerated, made alive by the Spirit, made a new man? And if so, then how could God take away the Spirit from Saul and let him die and wither? Let's first see what the Bible says. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6 and 9 to 11. 1 Samuel chapter, uh, chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 6, 9 to 11. God. That's tiring. <whistles> Keeps buffering. I'm going to go downstairs. All right. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6 and verses 9 to 11. Andrew, what does that got to do with the question, bro? Andrew, stop while you're ahead because I'm suspecting you want to pontificate and share and impress us with your knowledge. Stop, bro. Just listen, man. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6 and 9 to 11. 
Read. Read with me. And the Spirit of Jehovah will come upon thee, Samuel, telling Saul what's going to happen. God has anointed you to be the ruler of Israel, and here's what's going to happen. And the Spirit of Jehovah will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. This is a language of regeneration. It's not simply the Spirit will come and empower you to prophesy. The Spirit is going to change you into a new man, so that now you can do the will of God and rule according to God's will. Now notice 9 to 11. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. That's the language of new creation. That's the language of regeneration. That's the language of becoming a new creation, being born again. God gave him another heart. Okay. Oops, that's why I was doing this, because of the lighting. Sorry. And all those signs came to pass that day. Okay. And when they came to the hill, behold, a company of the prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. Now notice verse 11. And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, what is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among prophets? Okay, did you notice the language? Another man, another heart, right? Another man, another heart. You see it? Another man, another heart. You see it? That's the language of new creation. Hold on. Let me do this. Okay. This is even better, I think. Oops, let me do it this way. Let's see. Well, here, even better. I'll just do it this way. Hold on. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to get the best angle possible. All right. How about now? How's it doing now? Trying to get the best angle possible. Okay. All right. So, clearly, Saul was transformed and made a new creation. Right? Saul was transformed and made a new creature. You got the language there? I'm trying my best anyway. Oh boy, that's why I need my own place. We're better than that connection. You getting it? Yep, it's all right. Okay. All righty then. So now here's the question, though. First Samuel 16 says the spirit was taken away from him and an evil spirit came to torment him. And God cut him off and he died accursed. Does this mean, does this mean a person can lose salvation? You understand why this question was asked of me yesterday? Right? You hear me there? I want to make sure we're regrouped and we refocused because, hold on, if Saul was made another man, given another heart, that's the language of new creation, and had the spirit transforming him, and then God took away the spirit, and an evil spirit came and tormented him, and Saul went back to his vomit, right, withered and was cut off, then does that mean you can lose salvation? Now, what's the answer? What's the answer? Well, it depends on who you ask. If you are like me that believes someone who's truly of God, set apart, and belongs to Christ, and is born of the Spirit, and kept by Christ, and preserved by Christ, 
that that person will never lose his salvation because the Spirit will make sure to convict that person if he falls away to return and seal them in the love of Christ, then Saul is an, an exception to the rule. But if you believe that, yes, you can be born in the Spirit, united to Christ truly, and as long as you remain faithful, God will never count your sins against you. But if you choose to walk away, then God won't compel you to stay, but take away the spirit and hand you over to your vomit where you wither and die, then Saul is a perfect example proving your position. See the point? Everyone's silent. Do you see the point? You understand? Let me put it up here now. Let's see if this is going to be better. So it depends on your position. What you already assume and believe the Bible to be teaching. If you believe that those who are truly born of the Spirit, united to Christ and sealed by the Spirit, where the Spirit will change the person in such a way that that person cannot depart from Christ permanently, even if he falls away, he'll return because the Spirit will work such a work in that person's heart that he'll ache for Christ and return to him or remain faithful to the end. Then Saul is an exception to the rule. He is not the norm. He is an exception to the norm. But if you believe that, yes, you can be born of the Spirit, sealed by the Spirit, and united to Christ, but God will honor your choice to walk away. And if you do walk away, then it'll take away the spirit so that you now end up dead again and you'll wither and perish. Then Saul proves your position. You get my point? Because you cannot escape the language of 1 Samuel chapter 10. No vine. It's not temporary. Because the language vine is that he was made another person. Right? He was made another person, a new creation, a new creature, a new heart. That's the language of rebirth. This is the Old Testament way of saying he was born again. But then because of his rebellion, God got angry, was grieved, and took away the spirit that regenerated him and allowed him to die again and wither, vanquish, and perish. Vanquish and perish. Right? 1 Samuel 10, verse 6, and verses 9 to 11. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6, verses 9 to 11. So Paul, I'm sorry, Saul's example is a nightmare for those who believe that if you're born of the Spirit and you're kept by the Spirit, you'll never turn away permanently and therefore cannot lose salvation. Saul is a nightmare for that position. Saul is a nightmare for that position. You with me there? Now, what Saul teaches everyone, regeneration, immortality is contingent. Listen to me carefully by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Regeneration, being born again, immortal life is contingent, meaning... We do not necessarily exist e immortally. And regeneration is not something God owes us and is obligated to give us. But it is the gift of his grace that it regenerates us and gives us immortality. These are things that God gives us. But these are things he doesn't need to give us so that we don't have to necessarily exist immortally. We don't have to necessarily exist forever. That's the gift of his grace. But since God is the source of all life, he can, he can take away the life he gives us and we can perish and cease to be. God and only God necessarily exists. God and only God is necessarily immortal by nature. You get my point? You get my point? So Saul 
is a nightmare for those who believe that if you're born of the Spirit, united to Christ, you can never lose salvation. So those who believe that must argue that Saul is an exception. He's not the rule. In other words, God doesn't typically take away regeneration from those who have been born of the Spirit and united to Christ. Saul is an exception. Now, find the Bible making general statements that are general true with exceptions. In other words, the Bible will say something that's generally true without denying the fact that there are exceptions to that general truth, that general statement. Okay, son, I yearn his return out of here so that he can experience the loss of salvation. I'll tell you why it's not really strange. Let me show you, Andrew Martin. Hebrews 9, 27. The Bible is filled with exceptions to general truths. Statements that are generally true and apply generally without this overriding the fact that there are exceptions. As Holy Spirit grants me unction to speak truth clearly and interpret scripture correctly. Here, Hebrews 9, 27. Here's the general truth, a statement that is generally true and applies generally. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Wait, 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 wait. That's not always the case. Lazarus died twice. Lazarus died. Jesus raised him on the fourth day only to die again. The widow's son, Luke 7, 11, died twice. Because he was dead, Jesus raised him only to die again. Jairus' daughter died twice. She died. The Lord raised her back to life only to die again. All those other people that the apostles raised to life, because Jesus sent them to raise the dead, they died again. Now let's go to Hebrews 11, verse 5. The same author in Hebrews 9, 27 says, It's appointed for man to die once. Hebrews 11, verse 5, as the Spirit anoints the sound of my voice to be a blessing to you and enables me to speak truth without error for the glory of Christ. Hebrews 11, 5, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Wait, Hebrews, didn't you just say in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for a man to die once? Then why is it two chapters later, you're contradicting yourself and saying that Enoch did not see death? What about Hebrews 11, 35? Hebrews 11, 35. Exactly, Bill. Women received their dead, raised to life again. No, they didn't, Hebrews. You just told us in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for man to die once, not more than once. Why is it two chapters later you're giving us exceptions to that general statement, that general truth? Enoch didn't take death, and women whose children died received their sons back to life again, which means they died a second time. And others were tortured, not accepted deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Growing, you're not paying attention. And no, you're wrong. Nowhere does Hebrews 11 say Enoch is coming back to die. I'm going to challenge you, growing. I'll give you a million bucks and join your Orthodox church. Quote to me Hebrews 11 where it says it's Enoch. Why are you assuming that? Show me in Hebrews 11. So don't assume it's Enoch and Elijah like many people do. Or assume it's Moses and Elijah. If it was Moses... And Elijah or Enoch Elijah, John would tell us they are simply two prophets who will prophesy by the Holy Spirit for three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days, do miracles, be killed, and be raised on the third day and taken to heaven. Do not fall for the tradition of men that says those two witnesses in Hebrews 11 are Enoch and Elijah or Moses and Elijah, you ask them, where does it say that? And Sean, according to Jesus, he already returned. Sean, 
This again is what scares me about the current state of Christianity. Did you know, Sean, according to Jesus, Elijah already returned? I actually, my heart is heavy and I feel sad for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you know why? Because of the level of biblical illiteracy. Sean, even if Elijah were to return in the last days, I'm going to now force you to prove to me that in Revelation 11, one of those prophets is Elijah. If not, Sean, I'm tempted to block you because you didn't listen to me. Because the same Jesus you quoted told us Elijah already came. Sean, and see what you guys just did? You just brought up issues that are not relevant to the topic, forcing me to address these issues in order to cure this sickening level of biblical illiteracy. Sean, the same Jesus that you're quoting saying that will come in the last day, say he already came, Sean. Let me prove it to you, Sean, so that you never, ever misapply the words of Jesus. And I know you didn't do it intentionally. Okay. Matthew 17, verses 9 to 13. Guys, I get tired for you guys. And I feel pain for you guys because the church, and I'm not talking about the true church of Christ. The church in America and Europe has become a sick joke because of the level of ignorance among Christians. Okay, Matthew 17, 9 to 13. Okay, read with me. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore, restore all things. But now notice, he then goes on to say, But I say unto you, Elias is come already. Did you catch that, Sean? Yeah, he is going to come to restore things, but he already did come. And the people missed it. He already did come. But I say to you that Elias has come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they li listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Wow. So, Sean... Where did you get that Jesus said Elijah will come at the end when he said, yeah, Elijah's coming to restore all things, but he already did come and didn't recognize him. Moreover, Sean, who do you think appeared to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Matthew 17, verse 2. Matthew 17, verse 2. Hope this is challenging you guys, blessing you guys, and opening your minds. Matthew 17, verse 2. Bear with me. As I try to teach you guys, sometimes in a very strict manner. And I pray you take it in the spirit of love. Matthew 17, verse 2. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. What happens right in verse 3? He's transformed. Jesus transformed on the mount. Many people believe it's Mount Hermon. Transformed. Verse 3. Bam. Who shows up? And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. What else do you want, Sean? The actual Elijah showed up. The actual Elijah showed up. You see it? And then an Elijah type showed up. John the Baptist was that Elijah who was to come because he came in the same power by the same Holy Spirit that Elijah operated in. And then Elijah himself shows up. What else do you want? Let's look at in Luke 9, 33 to 35. Pay attention to 34. Luke 9, 33, 35, pay attention, 34. Watch here. 
And it came to pass as they departed from. Let's go to Luke 9, read 28 to 35. I'm sorry, guys. A lot of distractions, a lot of attacks of the enemy. Sorry about that. A lot of distractions, a lot of attacks of the enemy, a lot of annoyances. And connection is not the best. Again, Satan attacking. But we plead the Holy Blood of Jesus Christ to be our covering. Please, Holy Spirit. Okay? Sorry about that. And it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, who, which were Moses and Elijah, Elias. Pay attention. Moses and Elias. Pay attention. Go back. And then read 31. Who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Okay. One more time. Mark, not, uh, Mark. Father, loosen my tongue by the power of the Spirit. Save me from error for the glory of Jesus. Luke 9. I'm getting distracted because of the internet not functioning. Luke 9, 30, 31. One more time. Sorry about that, folks. A lot of spiritual attacks today. But Jesus is Lord, and we will be victorious in spite of it. Luke 9, 30, 31. Moses and Elias showed up in glory, right? Notice what they did when they showed up in glory. And spake of his decease. The Greek word is exodus. Did you catch it, guys? Moses and Elijah. Listen. Moses and Elijah are reminding Jesus of his exodus. So Moses and Elijah have come to prophesy to Jesus, you're about to die in order to enter glory. Folks, you understand what that means? Two dead human beings appear as disembodied spirits. And these disembodied spirits are sent to prophesy to Jesus, you're going to enter Jerusalem to die and enter glory. Who told you that those who are dead in Christ do not know what's taking place on earth? Right? You guys got it? Let's see what else Jesus said about John elsewhere. Matthew 11, verse 14. Matthew 11, verse 14. Oops. Hopefully this uh, my charger is doing good because last time I tried to charge, the computer died. I don't know. Pray against it in Jesus' name. Because what's going to happen is if this is messed up now, it's going to shut down my computer. I got to go get it fixed because I'm down to 33%. So I'll try to fight it till the end. In Jesus' name, Lord. Hold on. Yeah. A lot. Let's see. Okay. Please, my God. Okay. Now, Matthew 11, 14. Now, notice what he says about John the Baptist. And if you will receive it, if you're willing to accept what I'm about to say, this is Elias, which was... For to come. So, John, where did you get that Elias is still to come? Who told you that? Can someone tell me? Who told you guys that Elias is still coming? Anyone tell me who told you? Folks, where did you get Elijah's coming? Silence? Come on now. Can't be silent. Come on. We don't want to stay here all day. Jesus said, He's already can't come. If you accept it, he's already been here, John the Baptist. And on top of that, the actual Elias just showed up. So the actual Elias showed up, and John the Baptist is an Elijah type because the same Holy Spirit that empowered Elijah is empowering John to do something similar to Elijah and live similarly to Elijah. He's already here. 
What else you want? Luke 1, verses 15 to 17. Luke 1, verses 15 to 17. I really do get tired and I get burdened and my heart feels heavy for my brothers and sisters, you guys, because you've been fed so much misinformation. Luke 1, 15 to 17. Read, read with me. For he shall be great. This is Gabriel. Gabriel. Hold on, I think this is, I, let me see who's calling me. Hello? Yes, hi, how are you? Yes, ma'am. It's Mr. Mr. Shimon. Oh, it's there? Okay, I'm coming. I'll see you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I thought it was an important call. See, this is the beauty of live stream. You get warts and all, all these satanic distractions, a number that I thought I had to pick up to distract. You see, guys, the spiritual warfare? You know what that tells me? When the connection is really this bad, we get distracted. Satan is angry. Glory to the triumph God. Father, cover us with the blood of Jesus and seal us by the Spirit. Crush the head of Satan under the feet of Jesus and damn him to hell in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Get excited, man. Don't get upset. That's good news. When the attacks are on this level, that means this is a blessing. Satan doesn't want people to hear this. Woo! Static, man. Rebuke him, Father. Rebuke him, Lord Jesus. Rebuke him, Holy Spirit. All right? Get excited. Man. Oh, I feel like dancing. Yeah, I'm telling you, man. It's bad today. Look, look how bad it is. The connection, everything. Really bad. And I'm by the router today. Really bad. All right? And distraction left and right. Luke 1, 15 to 17 again. Oh, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Jesus. Let's see. Hopefully, it's not going to disconnect. Yeah, Adam Shika. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Talking about John the Baptist. Gabriel talking about John the Baptist. And shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And now notice 17. And he shall go before in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the uh, disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Did you catch it? Now notice it says in the spirit and power of Elias. He's not, it's, he's not saying Elias's human spirit will reincarnate in his body. No. In the spirit means the same Holy Spirit that empowered Elijah will fill John from his womb. In the spirit of Elias means the same Holy Spirit that worked through Elias is the same Holy Spirit that's going to fill John with power to do something similar to what Elijah used to do. Right? Everyone with me there? It's not saying Elijah's human spirit reincarnated in John. It's saying the Holy Spirit that filled Elijah with power to do ministry. That Holy Spirit will now fill John the Baptist in his mother's womb, empowering him to do something similar because he is that Elijah that was to come. And then to show you that John is not Elijah's spirit reincarnated. Elijah's actual human spirit shows up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses. Right? Everyone got it? Is it making sense? So who told you Elijah is going to appear again? Who told you? Misinformed Christians who do not interpret the Bible correctly. And I was one of them because I blindly parroted whatever I heard these famous preachers spew. 
Did that now clear that issue? Nowhere in Revelation 11 are we told the two witnesses are Elijah and Enoch. Nowhere. Nor are we told they are Elijah and Moses. Nowhere. Nor are we told anywhere in the New Testament that in regards to the second coming of Christ, Elijah will show up before Jesus appears. Nowhere. 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 Honestly, I, I'm tired. Honestly, I'm tired. And I feel burdened for you guys because I love you guys. Honestly, I am really burdened for you guys. It really hurts me because you have pastors, you have ministers, you have big name preachers making mega bucks, selling millions of copies of books, living comfortably, who have a wider audience. We're influencing people with such bad theology. And here we are struggling to make ends meet, struggling to fight a corrupt, evil, satanic system, a judge filled with Satan, a whore of Satan. And we do not have access to that audience to influence as many people as they do. Isn't it terrible, man? It's tiring. Tiring. This is why, honestly, when I said last time about giving the portion of your money for the glory of God, for the work of God, remember I said, at one time I'd say, give it to your church. And I said, no more. Because sadly, the churches, they're not doing the work of God or using the money for the purpose that money. So guess what? You take that money, give it to someone poor or a widow. And support the teachers and the ministers that you know are preaching the word for the glory of God and are not doing it for money. Right? Okay. Did that help you? Did that bless you? Did that educate you about Enoch, John the Baptist, and Elijah? And from now on, you will no longer repeat the nonsense. That the two witnesses of Revelation 11 are Elijah and Enoch or Elijah and Moses. No more. Nor will you ever say that Elijah will come before Jesus' second coming. Because Jesus in the Gospels has told us Elijah already came in two ways. The spirit of Elijah showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration with the spirit of Moses. And then John is an Elijah type. He is the Elijah that was sent to prepare the people for Christ because the same Holy Spirit that empowered Elijah filled John and empowered John to do a work similarly to what Elijah did when Elijah was on earth. Clear? Alex, that question hurts me and insults me, and I know you mean well. You mean... If they're there in their spirits, they're not literally there. So if you appear as a spirit, you're not literally there. What are you talking about, Alex? Alex, I love you, bro, but I'm about to hang myself with my shoestrings. What do you mean? Spirits, they were not literally there. So if they appear as a spirit, they're not literally there, Alex. So what do you mean literally? You meant to say physically, right, Alex? Alex, I'm going to take my shoestrings. Hold on. All right, all right. Alex, their bodies return to dust. No one is in a physical body that has gone to be with the Lord Jesus in heaven. No one, not even Enoch. The only one in a glorified body of flesh and bone, a physical body, is Jesus Christ. However, now that's biblically. That's the biblical teaching. You do have among what would I call apostolic churches, specifically Roman Catholics, who actually think there are two people in heaven with physical bodies that are glorified, Jesus and his mother, his blessed mother. Now, I don't believe that because I don't see any scriptural proof for it, and I don't see any evidence from the early writings of the church fathers for that position, right? Now, we can agree to disagree, but I'm not going to get into that debate. 
Alex, I don't know what you mean. If granted, he would give us bodies. I, I'm getting tired right now. I don't know what you're talking about, brother, honestly. I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean, Alex? This is why I'm going to have to start blocking people because they ask questions that they think are relevant. It's not. So, Alex, help me understand. Why would you need a physical body in heaven, Alex? Alex, you need to go, brother. This is too much for you. Take a break. Come back sometime next week. This is too much. It's overwhelming you. You're not getting it. Why would I need a body in the different levels of heaven, Alex? Why? Help me understand your logic. Why are you discombobulated and you're now in meltdown? What does powers have to do with body, Alex? Alex, you're confusing me, not only yourself and everyone else. You went from he can give us a body to powers. What does powers have to do with having a body, Alex? Help me understand, Alex. What does having powers have anything to do with a body? Help me understand. Friends, uh, we need to uh, send Alex on his merry way. He's too confused. This is too much for him. Alex, this is too much for you, brother. Come back next week. You're, you're, this is too much. It's overwhelming you. Sorry. He's all over the map. Everywhere. Okay. Anyway, sorry, guys. I apologize. If something's too much for you, it's better that you just step away. Because then you're going to get confused and confuse people and we can't focus. Okay. All right. Everyone with me here? My apologies, Alex. I'm sorry, but this was too much for you. You're getting so confused that you're all over the map and you're confusing us and not letting us Stay focused. All right. I don't know if this guy is insulting me, Sam O'Chill. What do we do with people who come and try to take chief shots, brethren? Remember, we're not going to attack. We're not going to get angry. We're not going to be in the flesh. We're going to glorify Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. And, guys, if I see you're struggling with this, okay, here, guys, listen. If I see there's a session that you're struggling with and it's too much for you and you're confused and you're all over the place and you keep confusing people, I'm going to have to remove you for the time being because it's too much. You're not able to handle it and you're not allowing others who are able to handle it to proceed because you're being distracting with all the questions because you're discombobulated. If you are confused and you can sit there in silence until by the grace of God's spirit you get it, that's fine. But when you chime in and then start distracting, then everyone else gets distracted and we don't advance. And it's not an insult or to put you down. People progress at different rates of speed. People progress differently at different rates because it's all the work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes Holy Spirit allows you to struggle with something, right? Before he allows you to get it. And he does that to stretch you, to teach you patience, right? Sometimes Holy Spirit, just in his grace, allows people to grow leaps and bounds. I have no control over that. I cannot make you see. I can't make myself see. I can't make myself understand. That's the work of the sovereign, almighty Holy Spirit of God. So if someone's struggling, I can't help you. I can't. I'm not. I'm being honest. That's that. I can't. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit allows people to sometimes struggle with certain things in order to stretch them and teach them patience. Right? So now for the rest of you. Yeah, see, again, he says it's kind of rele relevant. Not relevant at all. What, what does... The resurrection of the bodies of those who are dead in Christ at the end of the age have to do with Moses and Elijah, who are now in the presence of Christ as disembodied spirits, spirits without bodies. What has that got to do with the end of the age where they will come down as spirits and then their bodies will be 
reconstructed, recreated, glorified, immortalized, and united with their spirits to now dwell in physical bodies again that are immortal and destructible. What does that have to do as spirits? Nothing. Right? This took a lot longer than it should have. Okay? Took a lot longer than it should have. You see, brother, first, last, in the kindness of your heart, you unhit him thinking he's getting it. He's not. Trust my wisdom when I tell you, when they're not getting it, send them on their way. They don't need to be here for the session. Okay. Coming back again. Yeah, see, first, last, did it again. First, last, how much you want to bet me he's going to distract again. So then I'm going to have to block you out of love and then repent for it. Okay. For the rest of you. For the rest of you, let's focus. Did you understand? Nowhere does the New Testament say Elijah and Enoch are coming back. Everyone got that? Right? You get it? Okay. Nowhere does it say Elijah will appear before Jesus returns. Because we're told Elijah already showed up during Christ's first coming. Because John the Baptist is an Elijah type. And then the spirit of Elijah personally showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Is that clear? Did we get that part? Did we get that part? Did we also saw see in the case of Saul, which we've completely forgot. Because we went adrift. In the case of Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 10, Saul was regenerated, born again, made a new creation. Because the text says he became another man with another heart by the Spirit. Then lost that regeneration because the Spirit was taken away from him. And he was handed over to his sinful, filthy, carnal flesh. He returned to his vomit. And an evil spirit took over and tormented him. So he lost regeneration. Do we get that part? Was that clear? 1 Samuel 10, verse 6 and 9 to 11. Now, does that prove you can lose salvation? Well, that depends whether Saul is the norm, meaning this is what we are to expect from those who are truly born of God. If they commit a sin that's so heinous and blasphemous, that God will then remove the grace of regeneration and hand them over to the desires of their heart so that those Christians who believe you can lose salvation are right. Or is Saul an exception to the norm? Because I just demonstrated from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 9, 27, that the Bible will often make general statements, statements that are generally true, that apply generally across the board without the suggestion, suggesting there are no exceptions, right? Right? Because Hebrews 9, 27 says, it is appointed for man to die once. After that comes the judgment. But the same author in Hebrews 11, 5 and 35 gave examples in which Enoch didn't die and... Women whose children died were raised back to life only to die again. And then examples in Jesus' ministry where he raised people back to their mortal existence only to die again, as did the apostles, as did Elijah and Elisha. So there were many who died more than once. In other words, even Saul won't convince those who are convinced that those who are truly born of the Holy Spirit, united to Christ, can never lose salvation because the Spirit will preserve them till the end and forever. They'll see that as an exception to the norm. Right? So if you're convinced that the Bible clearly teaches that if you're truly born of the Spirit, Sealed by the Spirit, preserved by the Spirit, 
You can never be cut off from Christ and fall away permanently. Stephen, did you just chime in at the end of my conversation when I spent about 30 minutes explaining that very point? I love you, Stephen. Baptiste with a French name. Keep enjoying them croissants. Right? Okay, so even Saul won't convince someone who's convinced that the Bible teaches that, you, that if you're born of the Spirit, Sealed by the Spirit, you'll be preserved by the Spirit, so you can never be cut off from Christ permanently and fall away from Christ permanently because the Spirit will work in you in such a way to always bring you back and preserve you. Clear? But those who believe that someone who's born of the Spirit can lose their salvation looks to Saul as an example. Looks to Saul as an example. See? He was born again. He was transformed. He was made a new creation, born of the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. And he fell away, was cut off, and lost regeneration and handed over to his desires. Everyone got it now? Did we take care of the issue of Saul? Right? Hold on a second. I'm thinking my computer wants to shut down. Well, hopefully, pray doesn't shut down. Okay. Did we take care of that issue? Yeah, Jeremiah, Jeremy, they'll tell you yes. The Father will reject none that the Son brings to him, provided those want to remain in union with the Son and choose not to walk away of their own free volition. They will tell you that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will respect your choice to walk away and won't compel you. But if you work in union with the Spirit and desire to remain with Christ, then the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will never cast you away and preserve you perfectly to the uttermost. It's much more complex, and we're not going to solve this debate today in this session. Like I said yesterday. I'm not going to solve it, and no one after me is going to solve it. Solve it. No one before me solved it, solved it until Jesus returns. So that it, I just want to make sure through all these satanic attacks and distractions that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we still made it through this. We still triumphed, and we understood the issues at hand. Because I want to talk about the book of life. Because that came up yesterday as well. Anyone confused? That was with me from the beginning. That was listening from the beginning. Because those of you who just came in, you're going to have to go back and listen from the start to follow with me and understand the issue. So fine. That too means that you're not completely clear and following me. So where can I help you, brother? Ask me to clarify. What issue, what area? Okay, I got confused. One usually means, depending on what I ask. See, I'm so discombobulated. I got attacked by all sides. I'm discombobulated. Okay, all right. No one's confused. One, no one's confused. Two, yes, I am. Everyone got it. That's followed me from the beginning of the session because if you came in, the, in, mid, in, in midstream, in the middle of the discussion, you're going to get confused. So I'm not referring to you. Got to go back and listen from the beginning. In spite of the satanic distractions, computer acting up, buffering real bad, picture not clear, phone calls, my mind, you know, just shutting down, people going on tangents. By the power of the triumph God, by the blood of Jesus, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, we still manage to get through this. It's clear. Amen. No one confused. Because now I'm going to talk about the book of life. After many years of studying the Lamb's book of life, this is the conclusion I've come to. Okay. I'm going to go against the grain, against the norm. And I believe that what I'm about to articulate is what the Bible teaches. 
And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. And if I'm wrong, to convict me of my error, to correct myself and save you from my errors for the glory of Jesus. I used to believe that in the Lamb's book of life or the book of life, only the name of the redeemed were included. Okay, you with me there? What I was taught growing up in the Christian faith is there's the Lamb's book of life, the book of life. And only those who are born of the Spirit, who will endure and live with Christ forever, only their names are written in it. Upon further reflection, I don't believe that anymore. Well, I'm doing it right now, Airframe. And I'll do one session entirely devoted to it. But upon further reflection, I don't believe that anymore. Here's what I believe, and I'm going to prove it. Are you ready? I'm going to prove it. My understanding from the scriptures is that in God's book of life, every creature that God creates is mentioned, written by name, showing God's desire that he wants every creature to be saved, so he's included them by name. And what God does is then erases the names of those who don't come to faith or fall away and perish, and he erases their names one by one. Why? Because God is showing his desire, his intention. Look, every creature that I'm about to make is in this book because I want them all to be saved. So when I blot them out, it's not because I didn't want them to be saved. It's because they refused to repent and turn, or they made a profession of faith for a season, but fell away never to return, Showing you what my desire is, desire is and what they did. Are you with me there? This actually affirms what we call, I know I'm going to get in trouble with this, unlimited atonement, meaning that Christ died to procure the salvation of every creature and God's desire for every creature to be saved not just the elect who will be born again, united to Christ, and sealed by the Spirit. Even a Judas who ended up in hell, God desired his salvation, which is why Judas's name was in the book. But because Judas proved himself to be a child of Satan, his name was then blotted out. Are you now ready for the evidence for that? Can I prove it to you? We're going to use Judas as a case study. Even if you disagree with me, Take the passages, go back, read them over again, prayerfully asking the Spirit to show you if I'm wrong and convict me if I'm wrong, not to repeat this, but if I'm right, to then convince you of the truth of this position. Okay, I'm going to use Judas as a case study, and then now your eyes will be open and it's going to make sense. You're going to be like, wow, now it makes sense. Whereas the other position has a lot of explaining a way to do how people whose names are written are blotted out. Wait, wait. I thought only the names of the redeemed are written. Why is he blotting them out if you can't lose salvation? Now, let's go with Judas. Luke 10, 17 to 20. Let's start with verse 17. Luke 10, 17. Do you guys see how by the power of the blood of Jesus, by the fire of the Holy Spirit, our connection is perfect now? Because Satan was trying to discombobulate me and get me angry and frustrated, and he failed because of the blood of Jesus covering us. Luke 10, 17. Luke 10, 17. Don't put, post the rest yet, Protestant. Wait. Protestant, just put Luke 10, 17. Wait. One more time. Luke 10, 17. And the 70 return again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Folks. Folks. Can I ask you a question? When the 70, or 72 according to some other versions, came to Jesus rejoicing, saying, the demons submit to us in your name. Was Judas among them? Was he one of the 70? Was Judas among them, contextually?
Do I need to prove it or you, you, you guys? Oh, man. Come on, JoJo. JoJo, monster. Why wouldn't Judas be there? Where did Judas go? Hawaii? Maybe, Andrew? Pins and needles, needles and pins. Happy man's Amanda grins. Why would it be maybe? Where was Judas? Fishing somewhere? Maybe a vacation to Hawaii? <laughs> Andrew is good one. <sighs> okay. Let's go to Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. Let's do it. We were sailing along on a moonlight bay. Okay, Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power, 12 disciples. Don't tell me I got to prove to you that one of the 12 was Judas. Read with me. All right. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, right? Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labias, whose, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and unto any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Okay. Do I need to prove that Judas is one of the 70 who cast out demons in light of what you just read? Luke 9, verses 1 to 6. Luke 9, verses 1 to 6. Luke 9, verses 1 to 6. Then he called his 12 disciples. May he bless us all and keep us all. And gave them power and authority over all devils. Don't tell me that one of the 12 is not Judas. We just saw it. Right? And to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the King God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor script, meaning purse, a bag, right? Neither bread, neither money, neither neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide and then so, uh, depart. And whosoever will not receive you, when you go out of the city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel, healing every, everywhere. Twelve disciples. Is Judas one of the twelve? Yes. Was he given power to cast out devils and unclean spirits? Yes. Is that clear? Is that clear? Everyone got it? Now, Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. I'm sorry, Luke 10, sorry. Luke 10, verses 1 to 7. Luke 10, verses 1 to 7. Not Matthew, because I was thinking of Matthew. Luke 10, verses 1 to 7. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest is truly great. But the laborers are few. Pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves, carry neither purse nor scrip, meaning bag, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall, re shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. 
going up from house to house. Do I need? Do I really need to prove as Holy Spirit loosens my tongue and saves me from error? Judas is one of the 70 because the 70 include the 12. And in previous missions, when Jesus sends out the 12, clearly Judas is among them, given the same power to cast out devils, demons, unclean spirits. Do I need to prove that now? Do I need to prove it or no? Everyone sees it, right? Right? Okay. If you see it now, let's read Luke 10, 17 to 20. Now let's pick it up. Pay attention. The 70 return. Judas is one of them. There's nothing to show Judas, Judas wasn't there. Okay, let's read now. Pay attention. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Guys, pay attention. The 70, Judas is one of them because part of the 70 includes the 12, the 12 disciples, 12 apostles, and Judas was the, one of them. Notice what he says to them. No exception. He doesn't say some of you, most of you, many of you, you in general, all of you, no one exempted. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. This means demons. This is the echo of Genesis 3, <clears throat> verse 15. Genesis 3, verse 15. Anyway, this is an echo of it where Jesus is showing the fulfillment of it. And we'll get into that later. I don't want to confuse you. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions all over and over all the power of the enemy and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Talking about all of you. But wait, notice verse 20. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not. But don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject unto you. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Wait, 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 I'm confused. If he's addressing the 70, and part of the 70 includes the 12 apostles, one of whom is Judas, definitely. And we know from previous missionary journeys, the 12, including Judas, was given power over demons, over Satan. And the spirits were subject to them, Judas included, because of the power and authority of Jesus. Jesus just said, your names are written in heaven, including Judas. Why is Judas's name written in heaven when Judas belonged to the devil? Sinking in? God bless you, Orthodox believer. Anyone? Just to prove to you that Judas is included... In God's desire for salvation and blessing and glory, Matthew 19, 28. Matthew 19, 28. Speaking to the 12 again. Speaking to the 12 again. Bailey, after I give you this passage, I want to then block you. Here's why. Speaking to the 12 again. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I send to you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones. Bailey, twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He's talking to the twelve apostles at that time. Was Judas one of the twelve, Bailey? Was Judas one of the twelve, Bailey? Bailey, answer quickly. I don't have all day. Okay. So Jesus is telling Judas, you too will sit on a throne, on one of the 12 thrones, in the regeneration, when things are renewed, to judge the 12 tribes of Israel, showing that Jesus is including Judas in the regeneration and in the glorification of his followers. And then you're going to tell me that his name is not in the book of life? 
bounce this idiot, this child of Satan, out of here. Can you tell me why I get frustrated? So let's follow this moron's logic. Jesus says to Judas, I have a throne for you among the others. We'll sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And you're going to do it, Judas, in the regeneration, in the renewal. So I, I, my intention is to include you in the renewal, in the regeneration, and glorify you to sit on a throne judging with me. But that doesn't mean your name is written in heaven, Judas. Yeah, brilliant. Now, this moron can't blame his pastor for being this stupid. Sorry, guys. I'm going to be direct. No, Judas wasn't saved after all. John 6, 65, 64, John 6, 64, and 70, 71 says he wasn't saved. He belonged to the devil who didn't truly believe and... He was a son of destruction. John 6, 64, 70 to 71, and John 17, 12. Let's read those passages together. John 6, 64, John 6, 70, 71, right? And John 17, 12. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. I didn't say Protestant. John 6, 64 to 71. Pins and needles. Needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. I said John 6, 64 and then 70, 71. Pins and needles. Needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Now 70 and 71. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you 12? And one of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him being one of the 12. So right away, Jesus says, right? But there are some of you that don't believe. And John tells us he was including Judas who would betray him. And then later on says, though I chose you the 12, one of you is the devil. I know that even the one I chose to be part of the 12 is of the devil. And then John 17, 12. John 17, 12. No tipple bear, my sweet sister in the Lord. Judas didn't hang himself. He slipped on a banana peel and snapped his neck. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. John 17, verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. One more time, John 17, 12. The ones that are truly mine, that you gave me and truly belong to me, I didn't lose them. But the son of perdition, he's lost because he's the son of perdition, meaning the one for destruction. Right there. Did you know that this phrase, son of perdition, is used only... One other time. Tipple bear, bear, then you're not following the argument. Either you came in the midst of this because you did not understand or follow anything I said. I made my case clear. This is why when you come in the middle, please don't chime in. This is for everyone. If you come in the middle of the discussion, say nothing because you don't get it because you haven't been here from the beginning. It's not trying to be rude. Say nothing if you haven't been here from the start. If you've been here from the start, and you still don't follow, let me know. For the rest of you, are you getting it? Why was Judas lost? Because he didn't truly belong to Christ. Son of perdition. So then why is Jesus promising him a throne and saying his name is written in heaven? To show you that though Judas belonged to the devil, Joe, though Judas fell away because he didn't truly belong to Christ, still even Judas Jesus desired his salvation. Even Judas, God wanted to glorify, transform, and save, and bring into glory. But because Judas belonged to the devil and turned away, God erased his name from the book. I'm going to get there in a minute, Billy.
Okay. This phrase, son of perdition, Billy Mandalay, this phrase, son of perdition, is only used one other time in the New Testament by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, about the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. By Paul. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3. What does Thomas Aquinas' rebuttal got to do with my topic, Daniel? Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Let's read it. I'm going to do an entire session on the book of life, God willing. Okay. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That phrase, son of perdition, is only applied to two individuals, Judas and the man of lawlessness, and we know the man of lawlessness belongs to the devil, just like Judas. Okay, everyone got it or no? Everyone got it? That's been following from the beginning. So let's repeat again. Was Judas's name written in heaven? Yes. Did Jesus give Judas the same power and authority to destroy the kingdom of Satan, though he belonged to Satan? Yes. Were spirits subject to Judas? Yes. Did Jesus promise Judas, one of the 12, a throne in the regeneration, in the renewal, in the glory to come to judge the 12 tribes of Israel with Jesus, the Son of Man, on his throne as king of all creation? Yes, all these promises were genuine promises from the heart of Christ. And yet Judas fell away because he didn't truly believe. He didn't truly belong. He belonged to the devil, being the son of perdition. So how can his name be written in heaven only to be blotted out? The only explanation that makes sense, and I'm going to give you other verses now to back it up, is that the book contains the name of every creature, showing God's desire for the salvation of every creature. Here, all your names are here. I want all of you in it. But if you turn away or you don't come to faith, you leave me no choice to, but to blot you out, showing you it's not me who destined you to hell. It's your unbelief and your refusal to repent. Now, let me prove it with other passages. You ready? Exodus 32, 32 to 33. Exodus 32, 32 to 33. Notice it's not written. It's blotted out. You won't find a passage that says written. You're going to find passages saying blotted out, blotted out, blotted out, because it's already written. Watch, Exodus 32, 32, 33. Moses says to God, if you won't forgive Israel, right, then blot me out from your book. Notice, and Jehovah said unto Moses, whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Let's start at 32. Yet now, if thou will, will forgive their sin, and if not, if you're not going to forgive them, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Jehovah said unto Moses, whosoever hath shin, sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Wait, God, why are they in your, in your book to begin with? I thought only the elect who will be saved are written in your book. Why are you blotting out the name of the accursed who are cut off from your book? You got it there or no? Are you catching it? Moses, I will not blot out your name. I only blot out the names of those who sin against me. But hold on. Why are their names written in the book, God? I thought only the elect, only their names are in the book. Only the redeemed who will come to faith and be saved forevermore. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. That's the point. This is another tradition I bought into and I accepted blindly. Another tradition I bought into and I accepted blindly. Let's look at Deuteronomy 29 20. OK. 
Okay. Deuteronomy 29.20. Yeah, Tony, you got to go from the beginning because you're going to get confused if you chime in the middle. The, the Lord Jehovah will not spare him. Jehovah will not spare him. But when the anger of Jehovah the Lord and his jealousy shall sm smoke against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and Jehovah shall blot out his name from under heaven. Blot out. Wipe him out. So it's blotting, wiping out people who believe. You understand? That's what's happening in the book. People who are written in the book because God intends salvation and life for them, he blots out. Just like people on earth who live, he blots them out. Right? Is it making sense? Why and everyone else? Sinking in. Psalm 69, 27 to 28. Psalm 69, 27 to 28. Psalm 69, 27, 28. Add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Bam! That's the Lamb's book of life. Folks, there it is. The Lamb's book of life. Blot them out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Wipe them out from that book of the living. And Revelation tells us the book of the living is the Lamb's book of life. So again, why are their names written in it? Why are their names written in it? Everyone getting it? I'm going slow so you can get it. 406, good. Because Orthodox, I was told that if you do uh, Super Chat, they take 30% of the proceeds. And then when you file taxes, that's another 20%, so they take half of the proceeds. Anyway. Let's go to Daniel 710. If you want to donate a one-time gift or quickly, you can do PayPal. Go to PayPal and put on my email, sam underscore s-h-m-n at hotmail.com, right? So the Super Chat, they take 30%. They're crooks. So if you want to give the most for the men of God, like CP and Dave, do PayPal or something else. Anyway, now... Let's look at Deuteronomy 7.10, another reference to the book that's with God. Deuteronomy 7.10, chapter 7, verse 10. First last, just put my email. Thank you, guys. I can use all the support for the glory of Christ. Deuteronomy 7, verse 10. First last, put, put my email again for PayPal. Thank you, brother. Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, not Deuteronomy, Daniel 7.10. Boy, I'm having a rough day. Guys, bear with me. Daniel 7.10. Daniel 7.10. Okay. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment is set, and the books were open. Guys, remember the language. Book of the living, books were open, because this is going to reappear in Revelation. I'm showing you the miraculous consistency between the Old and New Testaments. There are books. One of which is the book of the living. Books, right? Okay. Daniel 10, 21. It's going to get juicier now. You guys are going to get blown away. Write these references down. Save them. Change your theology to agree with biblical theology, not traditions of men. Daniel 10, 21. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. See, there's a book of truth that records everything. I'm going to reveal some of the things in it to you, Daniel. That scripture of truth, that book of truth. Okay. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. This one is even more powerful. Daniel 12, verses 1 to 3. Daniel 12, verses 1 to 3. No, Justin is a brother. He's just, you know, having fun. Daniel 12, verses 1 to 3. Watch here. Watch the miraculous consistency, folks. 
And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. There goes the book again. Whoever's name is written shall be delivered. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn uh, many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Notice, God is saying, if you seek the wisdom of God, to know God, to know the Bible, and to apply it, and you convert others, you will be blessed and you will shine and rewarded in the resurrection. But did you see? It says those whose names were in the book will be delivered from this trial, right? You catch reference to the book again? Book of living, right? Books written in the book. I blot out the names of those who sin against me from the book. David says, write them out, blot them out from the book of the living so they won't be counted among the righteous. Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. Almost done, folks, with this session. Almost done. I beseech Euodius and beseech Sintiha, man, whew, that they be that they be of the same mind in the Lord, have the same attitude. And I entreat thee also, tr true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. So Revelation isn't the first time where the book of life is mentioned. David mentioned it. Paul knew about it. And Revelation tells us that book of life is the Lamb's book of life, showing that all who are written there are all those that the Lamb would die to bring life to. It's connected with the atoning work of Christ. Well, folks, here's the problem. If every creature's name is written in the book of life, and that's the book of life that's connected with the Lamb and His sacrifice, that they're there because the Lamb dies, to secure their salvation, but then slowly all the names written there are wiped out who turn away, then that means Christ didn't die only for the elect. He died for everyone, even those who end up turning away and having their names erased from his book. Wow. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Notice the promise of blessing, which assumes the opposite. If you don't do this, he that overcometh, if you overcome, Jesus speaking, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Wow, there goes the book of life again, and the warning to be blotted out again. If you overcome, I guarantee not to blot out your name from the book of life. Question, what if you don't overcome? What if you turn away and are cut off like Judas and Saul? Then I will blot out your name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Question, what if you don't overcome? What if you're ashamed of Christ? Will Jesus still confess you before the father and the angels and keep your name intact in the book of life? No, if you don't overcome, but you turn away and you're ashamed of Christ, not only will he not confess your name before the Father and angels, he will blot out your name from the book of life. You with me there? You catch what's happening? Can I prove to you that the opposite applies? Can I prove to you the opposite applies? If you overcome, your name won't be blotted out, and I'll confess you before the Father and angels. But if you turn away, Walk away or ashamed of me. I won't confess you before the father angels and I will blot out your name. Can I not show you the opposite is true? Matthew 10, 32 to 33. Matthew 10, 32 to 33. 
Notice that last part of Revelation 3, 5. I will confess him before my father and his angels if he overcomes. But notice the warning here. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my father which is in heaven. So you see, the opposite is also true. You overcome, you overcome, I won't blot out your name from the book of life. I'll confess you before my father and his angels. But if you are ashamed of me and you walk away, I will blot you out from the book of life and I won't confess you. Mark 8, 38. Mark 8, 38. Mark 8, 38. Watch here. Whoever, whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels, with the holy angels. Luke 9, 26. Luke 9, 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory in his fathers and of the holy angels. Did you guys catch it? You understand how these passages teach the opposite of the promise in Revelation 3, 5 applies? If you overcome, I won't blot out your name from the book of life, and I will confess you before my Father and the angels. Implication, if you don't overcome, if you walk away and you're ashamed of me, I will blot out your name from the uh, from the book of life, and I won't confess you before my father and the angel. I'll be ashamed of you. Right? Are you getting it before I move on? Everyone getting this before I move on? Because only a few people are responding. Let's go to Revelation 21, 27. Revelation 21, 27. Orthodox believer, what does that have to do with my topic? Revelation 21, 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You notice here, you have to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life to enter. But hold on. I just said everyone's name is written, every creature, even those who are cut off and fell away, like Judas. So what does this mean? In light of what we just read, what is this saying? What is this saying? If only those whose names are written in the Book of Life. Uh, Dan, I know your Calvinism is eating you up. And you're trying to make everything fit with Calvinism. I'm already answering Revelation 13, 8 and 17, 8, where it says those whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb of Life will take the mark. If you're listening, you get the answer, brother. See, this is what happens when Calvinism becomes your way of life. And he's a diehard Calvinist. He cannot interpret the Bible apart from the lens of Calvinism, which is why it's going to lead to his downfall. I'm already answering his objection, folks. I don't know if he's been here from the beginning. I've already anticipated it as a former Calvinist, and I'm answering it if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. Revelation 21, 27. Do you see what it says? It says, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will enter into the new heavens, new earth. But I just got done showing even people who've been blotted out, like Judas, their names are written in heaven. How do we reconcile that, folks? How do we reconcile that? See, Dan's Calvinism can't reconcile this because I know, because as a Calvinist, I couldn't reconcile this. See, no, notice Daniel's not even answering my question. I didn't talk about foreknowledge. If all their names are written in the Lamb's book of life, in the book of the living, in the book of life, and then God threatens to blot out names of those who sin and turn away, Number one, why are their names in, in the book of life to begin with? 
Why are the names of these people who turn away, who will be cut off, who will perish, either because they don't remain faithful or never turn to Christ, why are their names being erased and blotted out? What are their names doing there in the first place? So then explain to me Revelation 21, 27, those of you are getting it. It says only those whose names are in the Lamb's Book of Life will enter the new heaven, new earth. But if everyone's name is written, why is it not everyone enters? What's the answer? Thank you, Protestant believer. Take Daniel and send him to his daddy, Satan, this filthy barking dog. What's the answer? Blot it out. Why is it so difficult? The reason why they don't enter, because these are the ones whose names have been blotted out. Blotted out. Blotted out. Now let's go to Revelation 13, 8, 17, 8. Revelation 13, 8 and 17, 8. Let's see if we can reconcile this. Guys, I'm not here to tickle ears, and I'm not here to be an effeminate, wishy-washy Christian and be nice. If you're going to be a jerk and nasty, I'm going to go for the juggler and treat you like a fool. Proverbs 26, verse 5. You can't handle that style. I don't, I don't blame you. There are others who will be a greater blessing than me. Revelation 13, 8 and 17, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life. So now it's saying those whose names are not written in the book of life, they will be in awe of the beast, will be astonished by the beast, will worship the beast and follow the beast. What does this mean? If I've already shown from these passages, the names are written in the book of life and those who turn away. Those who are cursed, their names will be blotted out. How do we explain these two passages? Let's see if you're getting it. Those whose names are not written in the book of life, they will follow after the beast, be astonished about the beast, and worship the beast to their destruction. Because their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. How do we reconcile this? If I'm right, all their names are written, these individuals worship the beast because their names are not there. How do we reconcile this? So easy. It's not complicated. So easy. Because of their persistent sin and rebellion, their names had been blotted out. So their names are not written in the book, which is why they follow after the beast. Come on, guys. Hapsa, come on. Come on. It's not hard. Don't make it complicated. The reason why their names are not in the book of life and they follow the beast is because that reached the point of no return, reached the point of, of rep, <clears throat> reprobation that resulted in their names being blotted out, which is why they end up following the beast because that's part of their punishment. Now, let me prove that to you. 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, verses 9 to 12, speaking of the beast, the man of lawlessness, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 to 12, it's all about the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, the man of sin, and who follow him. Read. Here you go. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 to 12. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, pay attention, and with all deceivableness, he's going to use all deceit, trickery, cunning of unrighteousness in them that perish. Notice, who follows him? Who follows for his lie? Who falls for his lie? Those that perish. Now, why do they perish? Guys, pay attention. Pay attention. Why do they perish? Right? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause... Because they don't love the truth. They hate the truth. They hate God, his true word. And because of this, 
God shall send them strong delusion, which is the Antichrist empowered by the Satan to do wonders to deceive them, right? That they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There's your answer, folks. The reason why their names was not in the Lamb's Book of Life, resulting in them worshiping the beast and following after him, is because they had shown their persistent hatred of the truth, rejection of the truth, denial of the truth, suppression of the truth, so that God said, you've now reached the point of reprobation. You've reached the point of no return. I'm done with you. Blot out your name. That's why you'll follow after the beast. Do you see my method of reconciling these passages actually has no exegetical problem, whereas the other view that says only the elect and their name alone are written in the Lamb's Book of Life have problems that all these passages that talk about names that will be blotted out because those names must be the names of those who are not elect. So what were their names doing there to begin with? So which of the two positions has the harder time exegetically? The one that says every creature's name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, showing God's desire for the salvation of everyone. But those who turn away or never turn to Christ, then he blots their names out one by one. Or those that say that only the elect's name are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So then you got to explain why then is anyone's name being threatened to be blotted out? Vine, everyone else, you getting it? Now let's read the final one, Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. So those who don't believe what I said will have to do a lot of explaining away of these passages where God says to Moses, the one who sins, his name I'll blot out from my book. Or Psalm 69, 27, 28, where it says, blot out their name from the book of the living, O Jehovah. Or the fact that Jesus is looking at Judas as one of the 70, and he says, your names are written in heaven, and says to Judas, you'll be one of the 12 who sits on 12 thrones to judge the 12 tribes of Israel in the regeneration and the renewal of things when I come in my glory. They're going to have to do a lot of explaining away. Okay. Revelation 20, 11 and 15. Let's read. And I saw a great white throne. Pay attention to 12 and 15. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no found, there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, Stand before God. And the books were open. Remember the books? Remember that? That was in Daniel 7.10. Books were open, Daniel 7.10. And another book was open. This is the book of the living, the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, which is the book of life. And the dead, pay attention. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. Now notice the implication of what you're about to read. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now notice the implication. If God were to then judge and reward them according to their deeds recorded in the books, none of them would make it. That's why then he turns to the book of the Lamb of Life, the Lamb's Book of Life. See, if I go by your deeds, you all deserve hell. But wait, let me turn. Open up the Lamb's Book of Life. Their name written in it? Not. No, nope, not there. Off to hell you go. So the implication of Revelation 20 is if you depend on your works to escape hell, you're going to hell in a, ha a handbasket. Your only hope is your name is in the Lamb's book of life. 
Because if it's not there and he judges you according to your books that record all your deeds, there's no hope for you. That's why the text says, and then whose name was not found in the Lamb's book of life, he went to hell. What's implication? Clear implication. If God goes by your record of how you live, you're going to hell, buddy. You better hope your name is in the Lamb's book of life. But hold on. I thought you said everyone's name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So then why is it when he turned to the Lamb's book of life, the names of some or many wasn't found? Because they were blotted out. Either because they never turned to Christ and died in that state of unrepentance, blotted out, open up, not there, Lord. Or because they turned away, never to return to Christ, blotted out. So by the time you reach the day of judgment, their names had been blotted out. Right? Making sense? Let me exhort you, and I'm going to end it with one potential objection. You guys who just came in at the end, you got to hear it from the beginning. Let me exhort you. Don't be a Calvinist. Don't be an Arminian. Don't be a Catholic. Don't be an Orthodox. Be a Biblicist to the best of your ability. Beg beseech cry out to the holy spirit save me from all error from all human tradition and make me a biblicist to accept the bible as you want it to be accepted and understood and then give me the power to live out the bible for the glory of jesus if you keep restricting yourself to a particular tradition or school you won't be able to allow these passages right to say what they say you won't allow the passages to speak with the clarity in which they speak, and you're going to have to explain them the way. Honestly. And here, don't take my word for it. Take these passages about blotting out, present it to the Calvinist, and he's going to tell you it doesn't mean that. It can't mean that. Because only the elect have been predestined for salvation. Only the elect have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. And only their names are in the Lamb's book of life. And watch how they try to explain these passages away. Now, the Arminian has an advantage. You know what the advantage of the Arminian is? Oh, yeah, their names are written. But they lost salvation. Because the Arminian and the Catholic and the Orthodox believe you can lose your salvation and be blotted out. Vine, tell me about it. In my... Desire to be a biblicist, it's very hard for me to fit in with any group because any and every group that I try to fit in have arguments, criticisms, and objections. And some of them are not comfortable with me. Now, let me answer this potential objection, like that moron was telling me. Foreknowledge. Okay. Wait, wait. But God already knows beforehand who will turn away from him or who will never turn to Christ and be cut off, right? Yeah. So then why even write their names to begin with? Why even have their names in the book of life to begin with? Do you know why? You know what the answer is? Thank you. Thank you, Growing, for that compliment. I belong to the true church of Jesus Christ, as all of you do, born of the Spirit, sealed for the glory of Christ. Do you know why he would write the names of people like Judas, whom he already told you would betray and belong to the devil? Do you know why? To demonstrate, to prove, to show his love for every creature and his desire for the salvation of every creature so that if anyone ends up in hell, they can't blame him. No, 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 no. You're in hell because you're in hell. Don't blame me. I even knew you'd turn away from me and reject me. But to show you my desire for you, I had your name in my book all along to show you this is what I want for you. This is what I wanted for you, Judas. I wanted you to reign with me in the regeneration. I wanted you to be with me in my glory. I wanted you to dine with me in the new heavens and the new earth. So that I even told you your name was written there. You have a throne destined for you if you follow me. And on top of that, I'm even going to offer my body and my blood for your salvation. 
And still, you're going to betray me, turn away from me, and reject me. What more could I have done for you, Judas? Let me prove to you that Jesus even told Judas that he shed his blood for him. Luke 22, 19 to 23. Luke 22, 19 to 23. Vigard, if I had a church and you came to it, you'd be in trouble because you and me would mess up the church because we are two misfits full of sin and imperfections. Luke 22, 19 to 23. Read, read, read with me. Read, read. Vine, everyone, pay attention. Who's there when Jesus says these words? Luke 22, 19 to 23. Who was there when Jesus says these words? And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them. He didn't exclude anyone. This is my body, which is given for you. Notice he didn't say some of you, most of you, many of you, you, but not all. You, we're going to eat this bread. You, all right. This do in remembrance of me. Now watch, 20 to 23. Likewise, also the cup. After supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you, not most of you, not many of you, not some of you, not you, but not all. You, you here, who's going to drink it. But now watch, watch. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth, with, betrayeth me is with me on the table. The one who's going to be betraying me, he's right here now. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. Folks, help me understand. Judas is there. Jesus says, there's my betrayer here. One of you is going to betray me. And still, Judas is there. And Jesus says to Judas and all of them, this bread, Judas, and all of you is my body. For all of you, you too, Judas, this cup is the New Testament of my blood shed for not some of you, most of you. You accept you, Judas, for you. What more did Jesus need to do to show Judas, Judas, I loved you just as, just as much and just the same as I loved the rest. I gave you the same blessing, the same power, the same authority to do the same miracles, to destroy the kingdom of darkness, to raise the dead, to give sight to the blind, to heal the sick, get people saved. I fed you from the same table as I fed the rest. I clothed you. I let you sit next to me. I even bowed down and washed your dirty feet, John 13. I even promised you a throne and showed you I want you to be with me in the regeneration, in the new heavens, new earth, in the glory to come. And said, your name is written in heaven. What else, what more could I have done to show my desire for you, Judas, is not your destruction, but your salvation, because I love you too. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Forgive me for sins, imperfections, mistakes. If I made any mistakes, correct them in me not to repeat them and save them from those errors. Whatever was from you and is true, confirm those truths in our hearts and give us the power of the Holy Spirit to live them for the glory of Jesus to love you more, to live for, live for you more, and even die for you. Save us from our flesh, from the world, from sin and Satan. And please, Father, next Wednesday, save me from that court decision. Please, my God, save me and my daughters for your glory. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, to answer the question, to answer the question. Exactly, Bill. Then why didn't Judas repent? Why wasn't he forgiven? No, he didn't repent. Because so I, I, someone asked me this uh, the other day. But Judas felt guilty. He felt ashamed. He felt remorse. He was convicted. He betrayed innocent blood. And because of the guilt, he hung himself. Wasn't that a sign of repentance? No. No, he didn't repent. Let me answer the question. Let me tell you what true repentance is. Can you guys hear me? Am I buffering or you can hear me? Okay. 
True repentance brings you back to the feet of Jesus. True repentance brings you broken on your face, on your knees, crying out to Jesus, forgive me, master. Judas didn't truly repent because it didn't bring him back to Christ. It made him take his life into his own hands. That's not biblical repentance. Biblical repentance brings you to Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying if there's a true believer and commits suicide, that person is damned to hell. That's not what I'm talking about because we're talking about a different context. You can have true believers who, for some reason, God in his wisdom, allows them to suffer with depression, and they end their life not because they despair of Christ, but because they hate this world and want to leave this world and enter into the presence of Jesus because they're convinced they're better off with Christ. That's different from Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus. It ate him up, and he hated himself and never went back to the master for forgiveness. You understand the difference between the two types of suicides? You have believers who have already repented, whoever, who already have turned to Christ, who already love Jesus and cling to Christ, but they're saying, Lord, I'm tired. I can't do this anymore. I'm going to check out because I know I'm going to be in a better place with you. I can't. See, that's different. That's different. Right? Judas betrayed Jesus, sold him for 30 pieces of silver, and the guilt ate him up. So he committed suicide because of that guilt and shame, but he never returned to Christ. That's a different story. So true biblical repentance brings you back to Christ. Doesn't keep you away from him. Let me repeat. True biblical repentance brings you to the feet of Jesus, knowing he'll forgive you. It doesn't remove you from Christ or keep you away from Christ. Thank you, Billy Mandalay. Remorse is not enough. Going back to the feet of Jesus, broken and saying, I have betrayed you. Lord, forgive me. I love you. Please forgive me. That's true repentance. Please, guys, fast and pray for my miracle that this wicked judge doesn't summon me to Chicago. I can't go back. I'm here planted. No contempt. But I stay here. And the Lord save me from this debt that I cannot pay. It's his fight. And bring my daughters to me. I miss them and I ate for them. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Lord willing, I'll be back on tomorrow. I hope you're blessed. Go back and re-listen to this vine. I hope you are blessed too, all of you. And I pray we fall more in love with Jesus more and more every day. Take care.